let me introduce today's first speaker, Natalia Kokonova. Um, she's an undergrad in Moscow uh, studying RNA biology and her PhD in Axel Imhoff's lab, where she studied the structure of the interphase chromocenter, and that's what she'll speak about today. Um, and she's just recently moved to start a postdoc with Bill Earnshaw's group, uh, where she's studying what drives the compaction of mitotic chromosomes. Um, yes, yeah, so we're really excited to hear, hear what um, she's gonna tell us about, and Sally, it's all up to you now. Uh, thanks, Ben, very much for your introduction, and uh, many thanks to the organizers for organizing uh, this seminar series and giving me an opportunity to share my research with you. Uh, so today, uh, um, I will be talking about the structure of the interface chromocenter in Drosophila, which I started with two different methods, uh, proximity-based labeling and um, high resolution microscopy. And uh, I would like to start with the definition of the chromocenter. So if you take Drosophila polytan chromosomes from the salivary glands and stain them against the main heterochromatic protein, HP1 alpha, it stains a fused regions of those chromosomes. Similarly, in normal somatic cells, not in salivary glands, centromeres and paracentromeric chromatin from several chromosomes cluster into one structure, which core is defined by the H3 histone variant SENPE, and the outer layer is defined by HP1 alpha and H3K9 dime trimethylation. And due to the structural similarity with those fused regions, we call the chromocenter centromeres and pericentric heterochromatin. So we decided to study the structure of the chromocenter with uh, microscopy methods, and we did a three-dimensional reconstruction of high-resolution microscopy of Drosophila senpe in blue, one more centromeric protein in Drosophila HMR in red, and confocal microscopy of HP1 alpha in green. And what is interesting on confocal microscopy, Drosophila senpe in blue and HMR in red colocalized. But as you can see from this reconstruction, on high-resolution microscopy, these two proteins don't co-localize, they rather interdigitate and overlap only partially. And what is interesting, HMR in red is often bordering Drosophila senpe in blue from HP1 in green. So having made this three-dimensional snapshot of the chromocenter, we decided to study it with proximity labeling methods and as a method of choice, we chose Apex2 labeling. And how Apex2 labeling works in cells is the following. We take our favorite protein and fuse it to Apex. We express the construct in the cells. We treat the cells with biotin phenol, then for a short time with hydrogen peroxide, and then remove the free radicals with the specific quenching solution. And what happens during this short hydrogen peroxide treat time treatment Apex is producing biotin phenoxyl radicals from biotin phenol. And those biotin phenoxyl radicals fuse to the surface exposed tyrosines and other electron rich amino acids in proximity to the protein, which has been estimated to be around 20 nanometers. So, again, going back to this three dimensional reconstruction of the chromocenter, we've used Apex to Drosophila senpe, which is, uh, I remind here in blue to HMR, which is here in red, and HP1, which is here in green. And as a control, we've used Apex to nuclear localization signal. Uh, we defined the protons enriched in Drosophila senpe, H Apex, HMR Apex, and HP1 Apex pulldowns. And I have to say beforehand that HP1 Apex labeling was very similar to Apex NLS. So it wasn't very specific, probably because HP1 is very abundant and mobile and kind of samples the whole nucleus during its labeling period. But uh, Drosophila senpe and HMR protons turned out to be very specific. And in my further talks, I will focus on those two data sets. So we decided to visualize those protons as string networks of published protein-protein interactions, where each node is a protein, and the size of the node depicts the enrichment of the protein in the pulldowns, and each edge corresponds to the interaction between the two proteins. 
And if we visualize uh, such networks, what we can see are clusters which are functionally or structurally relevant, for example, centromere, replication, or nuclear pore. What is interesting, if we look at those two proximity networks of the proteins, which are separated only by high resolution microscopy, some of their clusters, although they contain slightly different sets of protein, they're conceptually similar. For example, replication, nuclear pore, centromere, nucleolus, and transcription while some of the clusters belong only to one of the two networks. For example, cohesin condensin, polycomb, nucleosome remodels, and boundary factors belong only to HMR apex proximity network, while RNAi belongs only to Drosophorus and Pei apex proximity network. We further decided to focus on two sets of candidates found in proximity to Drosophorus and Pei and HMR. One of those candidates is Drosophilus MC. Here it is. So Drosophilus MC is a very well described interactor of both HMI and Drosophilus NP, and its role in Drosophilus NP incorporation has been very well documented. However, what we're interested in is the architecture of the chromocenter, and the role of Drosophilus MC in the structure of this domain has been not very well described. And we decided to fill in this gap. We uh, removed Drosophilus MC from the cells and stained the cells against the three chromocenter protein which we are studying, HP1, Drosophilus NP, and HMR. And um, uh, as I mentioned, on confocal microscopy, HMR co-localizes with Drosophilus NP. However, if you remove MC from the cells, it no more co-localizes with the Drosophilus NP, but rather occupies a domain in the nucleus reminiscent of HP1 alpha staining. Um, and this fraction with uh, heterochromatic HMR cells goes up. Interestingly, if we do chip sequencing of HMR upon SMC knockdown, the binding size don't change much which suggests that HMR binding sites de uh, could decluster from the centromere and diffuse into heterochromatin. And the same declustering happens to the centromeres. If we look at Drosophilus and Pei staining upon GST knockdown, there are a few distinguishable SEMP A clusters, which are, however, very bright. And these clusters become more in number and less in intensity upon Drosophilus and Pei knockdown. Lastly, we asked what happens to the paracentromeric heterochromatin upon Drosophilus MC knockdown. As one can judge by the HP1 staining, nothing has really changed. However, we decided to confirm it with one more paracentromeric marker, which is D1 protein. D1 occupies 359 base pair repeat blocks at the paracentromeric chromatin of some of the Drosophila chromosomes. It typically forms one to three domains in the nucleus at dapid dense regions. So we removed some C from the cells and quantified the number of D1 falsi. And as you can see, it has not changed much. This all brings us to the following model. So let's imagine the chromocenter as a multi-layered wall. In the center, there is SENP A chromatin. It is surrounded by the outer layer of uh, HMR chromatin, which forms a border between the co-centromeric and the paracentromeric chromatins. And this HMR layer is surrounded by the third layer of the HP1 chromatin. Interestingly, the inner two layers are SMC dependent, whereas the outer layer is SMC independent. Um, in other words, what happens if you remove Drosophila SMC from the cells is uh, Drosophila SMP declusters, HMR declusters and diffuses into heterochromatin, while HP1 stays intact. And with this, I would like to move to the very short second part of my talk, which is exclusively about HMR protein. Why is HMR so interesting to us? Well, because it's not only a protein of the chromocenter, but also a protein involved in speciation. What does it mean? If we take Drosophila melanogaster mother flies and cross them to Drosophila simulans father flies, the male progeny is lethal, while the female progeny is unfertile. However, if we remove Drosoph uh, HMR from Drosophila melanogaster or LHR from Drosophila simulans, the hybrids survive. And people have been wondering what this HMR gene is doing in pure species as well as in hybrids. And if we look at the brains of HMR knockout flies, they exhibit clear problems in mitosis. 
In particular, there are anaphase bridges, lagging chromosomes, and broken chromosomes, which all points to the problems with sister chromatin detachment for which the cohesins proteins are responsible. In hybrids, HMR, together with its partner protein LHR, is overexpressed. These two guys form a complex and stabilize each other. When the complex has elevated expression levels, it mislocalizes from the centromere and gains additional binding sites all over the genome as seen by the HMR staining of this polytent chromosome from the hybrid fly. Interestingly, chromosomes in the brains of these hybrids are fuzzy and uncondensed upon particular staining conditions if we compare them to the chromosomes from the normal flies, which possibly points to the problems with chromosomal condensation. Uh, remember I showed this uh, proximity network of HMR apex, and we found cohesin and condensin proteins in proximity to HMR. I have to say that cohesins and condensins are not HMR interacted by IPMS, so this is exclusively a proximity labeling finding. And we decided to develop it further, and we took advantage of the chip sequencing data of HMR, HMR upon overexpression, cohesin subunit red 21, and condensing subunit cap H2, and we aligned all the chip sequencing profiles in the center of the HMR chip sequencing signal. And as you can see, those three proteins colocalize pretty well, and this colocalization is enhanced upon HMR overexpression. What is interesting is that those three guys sit at tight boundaries, the architectural spots of the genome. Indeed, if we build the composite chip sequencing plot of cap H2 HMI and RED21, the peaks perfectly coincide with the dip in the TAT separation score. So, uh, what do we have? HMR has condensing in proximity to it. It co localizes with condensing on chip sequencing. In hybrids, where HMI and LHR are overexpressed, there are possibly problems with chromosomal condensation. Of course, we decided to uh, simulate the hybrid situation to overexpress HMI and LHI in, in, in cells and uh, see what happens to condense and binding to chromatin. Uh, and we focused on the cap H2 subunit of condensin 2. And as you can see from these examples of genome browser tracks, upon HMI LHI overexpression, some of the condensing peaks stay intact while at some of them, uh, the cap H2 signal is reduced and the overall cap H2 signal upon HMI LHR overexpression is reduced. Which brings us to the following model. Uh, there are a lot of tight boundaries all over the genome occupied by cohesin and condensing. Sometimes HMR pops up. When we overexpress HMR, it occupies additional tight boundaries and condensing binding to chromatin is reduced. We would very much like to speculate that this reduction of condensing binding to chromatin leads to the problems with chromosomal condensation in hybrids and eventually to hybrid lethality. And with this, I would like to finish. Uh, I would like to say big thanks to my former lab, in particular to Axel for mentoring me, uh, to uh, Tamash from the bioinformatics facility of the Biomedical Center for all the bioinformatic analysis and to Andreas from Bioimaging Facility of the Biomedical Center for Stead Images, and also to my bench neighbor, Andrea. And I would like to say many thanks to the Earnshaw Lab, uh, in particular to Bill for mentoring me, and also to the people whom I'm mostly working with, Kumiko, Itaro, Elisa, and um, Lucy, and also uh, Caitlin and Alba from JP Lab who are not on this photo. And uh, thanks for your attention. I will be happy to take questions. So thank you so much, Natalia. That was a fantastic talk. So um, we've got one question here from Palabi. So I'm just going to allow you to talk. And I remind everyone that you can type your questions into the Q&A or raise your hands. Go ahead, Palabi. Hi. Uh, great talk. I was just okay. wondering, so uh, I don't know if I've missed that the recruitment of, uh, like, does the localization of CENPA changes in the CENPC knockdown? Uh, and if, so in terms of recruitment, uh, what do you think is uh, uh, also recruiting the CENPC that uh, to its 
to the chromo center what is that determining its specific localization there and how and in terms of the sequential recruitment uh, what do you think is uh, like uh, senpi or senpc which comes first and how much do the other one uh, affect the recruitment of the uh, or is it completely independent so independent of what so uh, basically um as far as i understood so basically you ask two different questions first uh, how do we know that senpei upon senpsi knockdown declusters and not delocalizes from the binding sites yeah, yeah well formally we cannot exclude it and we cannot really chip seek senpei because it binds to repetitive sequences uh, but what we can say we stained uh, senpei together with the proteins of paracentromeric heterochromatin and what i can say is that uh, Senpei stays close to the paracentromeric heterochromatin. So we assume that it doesn't mislocalize. And answering to the second question, uh, so SENPC localization and Drosophila is defined by several factors. Uh, there are three main centromeric proteins in Drosophila. Histone H3 variant Senpei, SENPC, the only protein of the centromere associated network in Drosophila, and histone chaperone Cal1. Uh, these three guys show interdependent localization. And what is interesting, if you um, take these three proteins of Drosophila and express them in human cells, what was shown by the Hoyne lab, is that basically you can reconstitute Drosophila centromere in human cells. So they form a tiny centromere party. Thank you. Okay, so we got time for one more question. Uh, so Alan Underhill, I'm gonna unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Great, thanks very much, Thank really you. nice talk. So uh, both the inner centromere and pericentromere have been described um, in the context of phase separation. So I'm just wondering if you guys are looking at that in the context of how you get this multi-layered structure. Uh, we haven't looked at phase separation yet. Okay, so it'd probably be, yeah. I mean, probably interesting just in the context but of what's going was on. reported to form phase separated structures in Drosophila. There is a great work from Gary Carpenter's lab. Right, yeah. And the inner centromere has been shown to arise by a similar process. So it would just be interesting to see how they're organized in Drosophila from that standpoint, but nice yeah, work. Sure. It's an interesting point. Okay, thank you so much, Natalia.